now at Luke 15, beginning at verse 25. Now this story is a story of the prodigal son. It's a famous story and a familiar story. And yet, nearly everybody who ever preaches the story stops at verse 24. I always did. And they stop with the young man coming home and getting saved and they live happy ever after. But there's a kind of a postscript on the story you need to read sometimes. And I'm going to preach on the subject this morning, the curse of Christianity, or the elder brother, the elder brother. And we're going to begin Luke chapter 15, verse 25, and see this postscript the Holy Spirit has put on this story. Luke 15, beginning at verse 25. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. Dancing's in the Bible. They dance when somebody gets saved. A little different most of the dances he's been through. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Thy brother is come, and thy father has killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry, and would not go in. Therefore came his father out, and entreated him. And he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgress I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which had devoured thy living with harlots, thou killed for him the fatted calf. And he said to him, Son, thou ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. Father, I have the blessing of the Holy Spirit, the reading of your word, may it bear fruit and prosper in the uh, thing wherein do you send it today? For Jesus' sake, amen. Now this is the story of the elder brother in the Bible. And this elder brother didn't die out in the first century. We still have the elder brother in our midst in 1970. And the elder brother has a great influence on his family and his friends. In this story, the boy came home and got saved. And everybody in the house was shouting and praising God for it and dancing, jumping up and down. Thank God the boy got right, and they should have. And outside was the older brother who never did make a mistake in his life. And he was out there in the field hearing that thing, and he said, what's all the celebration about? And they said, your younger brother got home and he got saved, and praise God, he's safe and sound, and they're giving him a party. And the older brother said, giving him a party? spending money on a no account, gives up a rascal like that, and then the little conversation takes place between the boy and the daddy. Now, the elder brother's trouble was a trouble that we're all afflicted with to some extent, more or less, and that's this business called self-pity. I'm going to talk about the cause of self-pity, the results of self-pity, and the cure for self-pity. And it's a disease that afflicts everybody one time or another. Now there are certain causes for self-pity in the text. Notice in verse 28 that uh, he refused to go in. He wouldn't go in and join the crowd. Wouldn't get with them. Self-pity usually begins by pulling yourself off and getting alone and licking your wounds and feeling sorry for yourself. And the cure many times for self-pity is just to get with some folks and forget the whole matter. He wouldn't go in. He said the father came out and treated him, and he still wouldn't go in. And that is no. Look at verse 30. He wouldn't call him brother. Did you notice that? Thy younger son that wasted your substance has come back. How come he didn't call him brother? <laughs> Dropped off the brother and began to refer to him in the third person indefinite neuter, or whatever you call it, and say, thy son, you know, well, he was his brother. And this fellow here, the cause of self-pity is this. This withdrawing and this, uh, I can no longer have a uh, fellowship and call him brother, and uh, I can no longer, after all, I'm so much better than they are, I just can't have fellowship with them. That's caused a lot of self pity, a lot of self righteousness, too. Uh, Jonah was that way. Jonah was that way. Uh, Jonah sat out there in the hillside, and the Lord said, Go down and do personal work. And Jonah said, what for? And the Lord said, what for? Man, you had 120,000 conversions. Hadn't you better do some follow-up work? And Jonah sat out there on the hillside and got mad wouldn't go down. He wouldn't go. You know what he was doing? He was feeling sorry for himself. He said, boy, when I get back home, when I, and people find out I've been preaching to Gentiles. And he said, boy, when I get back home and people find out that the God didn't overthrow that place in 40 days and 40 nights like I've been preaching, my name's going to be mud. I've already had it without that insult added injury. He was out there licking his wounds and wouldn't go. 
Did you know one of the cause of self-pity is refusal to go? Uh, one of the greatest cures for self-pity is get up and go. Get you a bunch of tracks and get out there and get with it. Go. Uh, just sit in the same old circle, go on a circle around yourself. You never get anywhere. All you'll see is self. All self magnifies itself. I don't care what you do, even look at. Oh, there he is again. Uh, you got to get away from it. He refused to go. He refused to go. I thought like one of my students came to one time about three years ago, and this is undoubtedly the world's most unusual university. <laughs> uh, they come and I and I've got all the personal problems in this average school. I have a dean of men handle it. We don't have a dean of men. And so they come to me and a fellow came to me and he said, boy, you don't know what I've been through. You just don't know what I've been through. I said, tell me, man, tell me. Well, he had to work with a bricklayer that day. <laughs> that guy actually thought the end of the world had come because he had to work one day with a bricklayer. And he thought about how I had to push this wheelbarrow, you know, and pick up these bricks and carry this load. I said, good, man, good, fine, fine. Oh, man, I thought, I thought I'd die. I said, well, you didn't. Well, I never do that again, you know. I, well, what I've been through today, it'd be good for the fellow to get to it. That fellow feeling sorry for himself. Got a couple of blisters on his hand. <laughs> well, you poor sweet little boy. <laughs> a couple of blisters. Why, well, blisters won't kill you. They won't kill you. They get tough half wild and turn to calluses. That's good for you. He wouldn't go. He wouldn't go, and he wouldn't go. He refused to grow. When Christians get feeling sorry for themselves nine times out of ten, they said, Lord, uh, hither will I go, and one step further I will not go. The Christian life is so demanding. And it's, uh, you know, you always have to be climbing. Don't you get tired of climbing? Just one test after another. You get through one, here comes another one. Get through another one, here comes another one. After a while, you say, I would just won't, I just won't, I just, I just had enough, I'm just through, I just, hang on here. And that, then you start feeling sorry for yourself. That's one of the causes. Refusal to grow. Do you ever see children sort out food? Uh, I allow my children uh, one or two liberties. I allow one of my boys not to eat tall salad. I allow him that much liberty. I allow the other one, uh, he doesn't have to eat liver. That's as far as it goes, brother. Outside of there, what on that plate, brother, you eat it. You eat it. And the Lord, you know, sometimes give us a plate and say, take, eat, eat all of it. <laughs> and you say, Lord, but I don't like this, and I don't like this, and I don't like this. And you start feeling sorry for yourself and start whining. Oh, I've got such a terrible father after you all this nasty food. You've got a good father. You've got a good father. And that cause of self-pity comes from refusal to take what's dished out to you. It's given to you to help you grow. Help you grow. Some Christians just go so far and just stop. You pick them up 50 years later, they're right there. This town is filled with them. It's just filled with them. I've seen Christians live so much in the past that all they could do was try to get together the same crowd of folks they were raised with. They don't realize up in their 70s and 80s and haven't done anything for God. Whole life just shot. Just shot. Just shot. They refuse to grow. Some of them, I think they go backwards. I think they, the growth is not only stunted, I think they shrink. Like a guy, one guy kept taking a steam bath, you know, to get rid of weight. And a fellow said, too much, that's bad for you. And one day he walked in there and a midget came out of the steam bath. <laughs> it looked just like him, you know, and he said, I told you to get you. I told you to get you after a while. <laughs> Wasn't the same man, you know. But sometimes when I see God's people, you know, one time and see them a little bit later, I think, uh -huh, that self pity will get you. It'll get you. It shrunk you down. And listen, an exaggerated self-righteousness can make you feel sorry for yourself. Look at verse 29 in the passage. Verse 29, that fellow saying, Neither at any time that I uh, transgress thy commandment, see? See that thing? I mean, here comes your boy that's devoured your substance with righteous living, and <clears throat> I never did. I never did that. The surest way to get feeling sorry for yourself is get an exalted opinion about yourself. Because if you get blown up in your own eyes, then you won't think you get what you have coming to you, see? So folks get stuck in themselves, and they get stuck in themselves, and will get real self-righteous, then I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not recognized, you know. I, I'm not getting the honors that are due me. <laughs> Cheer up, you will. And they get up in life that, you know, where they get through that way, and then they feel sorry for themselves because they're not getting the recognition they ought to have. That's the older brother's trouble. Exaggerated self-righteousness. The Lord said to the Jews in Deuteronomy 28, 47, 
I'm going to do this to you and this to you and this to you and this to you and this to you. And they said, why? And he said, because you don't serve the Lord with joyfulness and gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. I never have forgotten that passage. I read that thing before I was saved. Just like it tore me up. I never have forgotten that passage. One of those passages that I never have forgotten. The background of the law. I got my the law. I never did out of stand the bullet before I was saved. <laughs> And I got back here in the law and got to lead to there, and you know what it said back there? It said, Well, now it come the Lamb with the Lord thy God, give us thee, and get houses that you didn't build, and land that you didn't plant, and money that you didn't earn, and all this stuff, then beware lest thou forget the Lord thy God. I never have forgotten those words, brother. Those engraved the tables of our heart and my mind, they'll be there forever, brother. And he says, you better look out when you cease to serve the Lord with joy and gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. Oh, uh, some of you are short this morning. You're not much short. You're not much short. You've got clothes. You've got suits. You've got shoes. You've got a toothbrush. You've got things to clean your teeth with. You've got food in your stomach. You've got, you got a good bit. You got a good bit, and the self pity this oh, but if you don't know how trouble I was in, oh, and oh, there are plenty of people that are worse trouble than you are, brother. Believe me. And if you don't know that, you haven't been very far. That that self righteousness can get you feeling sorry for yourself and whining and licking your wounds, and it can ruin you. It can it's a curse of Christianity. All right, now I'm going to talk about the results of self pity. The results of self pity. Look at verse. 30 and 31 and 32 down there. He thought the father was obligated to him, see? He said, you never gave me a party. I did this and that, and you never killed a fatted calf for me. He thought the father owed him a fatted calf. See? Well, the father's under no obligation to you. Uh, the Bible said, when well, you've done all things that you ought to have done, to say we are unprofitable servants, we have done only that which was our duty to do. How about getting the younger brother back? Wasn't that a big enough reward? I've got an older brother. I don't have a younger brother. So if I saw my older brother reclaim and get back, that'd be reward enough for me, brother. I'd be doing some shouting. I, I wouldn't care where he got saved. I wouldn't care if he got saved and I... I can't say it. <laughs> I better have not say it. <laughs> Any kind of a church. <laughs> That's the truth, man. I wouldn't care if he got saved in any kind of a church. If my older brother got saved, he's a year older than I am and just heading on down the slow road to hell and Bobby Hill, he doesn't have any wife, children, cousins, aunts, nephews, nieces, mother, daddy, nothing. And no job. And nothing but the bottle. And you think if I saw him come home and they said, Rejoice and be merry, for thy brother was or was dead and was alive again, he was lost and was found, you think I'd hang right outside the building and say, I won't go in. That ever gave us me a fatted calf. Man, the Lord gave me so many fatted calves, I couldn't even eat them. <laughs> hang around outside. You know what that is? That self pity. That's a curse. That's a curse. There are people that's been here this morning, if your younger brother got in life with God, you'd shout and you'd hit the ceiling. Amen. Hang right outside. I don't like the message he preached when he got saved. I don't like the way he came to the altar. The preacher raising his voice. That preacher's too crude. Bad taste. He's too abrupt. I don't believe in a prayer altar. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know there are people like that? And when, when they ought to be rejoicing and shouting and praising God to hang around the outside of the building, you know. <clears throat> I won't come in. You won't catch me back in there dead. You know what Matthew Henry said one time, one of his commentaries? And he said some things. Henry said one time, one of his commentaries, he said, if you get robbed, he said, you ought to think, first of all, they didn't rob me of much. Secondly, you ought to think they didn't rob me of everything. Thirdly, you ought to think they didn't rob me of my life. And fourthly, you ought to think, well, thank God I didn't do the robbing. See, like you can count when the rest is through. And you know, when, 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 when you get feeling sorry for yourself, you know what one of the first results is? The first, one of the first results is you get a distorted sense of value. See? That fellow's wondering about that fatted calf and that substance of his daddy, and a young man has just got saved and got home. Well, you know anybody that's got a proper sense of value knows what to rejoice about there. And when you get feeling sorry for yourself, it's funny how you can't see anything right. 
You get a distorted sense of value. Elijah got that way one time. He lay down in a juniper tree and he said, Oh God, I'm no better than my father's take my life. And when he got like that, everything got distorted. Uh, one time he got up on uh, Mount Carmel and he killed 400 men. Did you ever uh, think of the energy it takes to kill 400 men with a sword? I mean, decapitated 400 heads with his hand. He killed them. He did the killer. 400 men, boy, you talk about blood and gore, and you talk about something it takes to cut off the head of 400 men, even to pick up the sword and bring it down that many times. After that great contest for the prophets of Baal, and ridden himself of 400 of Baal's prophets, he got one letter from a woman, and he liked to lost his hair, like to lost his teeth. Guy out there saying, oh Lord, I know better my father's running just because of one call. One call. We get, isn't it peculiar how they get, you know? You can't see the thing properly. And when you get feeling sorry for yourself and, oh Lord, take my life, I can't stand anymore, then everything gets twisted. You get the values all changed. You get them messed up. That's what happened to the older brother. Number two, when you get feeling sorry for yourself, you unconsciously magnify yourself. Did you notice what that brother did? He said, I never at any time have transgressed your commandments. And the father said, go in. And he didn't go. Did you notice that? I mean, the father said, go in. The father said, I never disobeyed. Why are you disobeying right now? The father said, go in. And the man wouldn't do it. And right when the fellow was saying, I never disobeyed you, I kept your commandments, he was disobeying one of them right there on the spot. You get that unconscious, you know, um, <clears throat> you, and you magnify yourself unconsciously. It, it begins to boast. And when he's boasting, then he's, he's doing wrong. Uh, sometimes you do it unconsciously. Uh, self is such a peculiar thing. Uh, the longer I live, the more I believe that's the main problem. I guess that's what you call ultra conservative, but uh, you just begin to find that out, you see. And the only thing that'll kill self, I guess, is death. And there's this unconscious, sometimes you do it when you're not even aware of it. A man said to a famous preacher one time, and he was a great preacher, he said, I don't see how you can know as much as you do and talk so plain. And when he said that, the preacher unconsciously blushed because he became conscious of himself at that particular time, you see. And he wrote later one of his memoirs, he said, if I'd had my mind on the Lord when that fellow said that, I wouldn't even notice what he said. And what the fellow said was true, but <laughs> the self knew it. I mean, secretly the man was thinking, yes, I am very plain for a man that knows as much as I am. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That old self, it comes up in the strangest places, you know. And when you start feeling sorry for yourself, then it's just self, 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 self. And even when you're not aware of the fact that it's yourself, it's still yourself. That's one of the results. And that isn't all. A person that gets this self pity and gets this thing going, they, they get destructive to everybody else around them. It's the strangest thing. This situation ethic says, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else. Well, let me tell you something. A man that lives for self, or a woman that lives for self, a man or woman that just lives for self, to preserve self, to take care of self, does damage everybody they touch. And that's something they don't know in the psychology classes. And maybe some of these dumb uh, brickheads get around to finding out those things, it'll be too late for the American young people. This theory, well, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else, you know, it'll be all right. Listen, the man that goes just by the principles that I, I'll get what I want as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else or anybody he touches. The Christian doesn't live by those principles of as long as I get what I want, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else. The Christian lives by the principles, what can I deny myself for Jesus' sake? There's a difference. There's a difference. There's a difference. And you can always spot these people that take those shine kind of attitudes. You know what they are? They're like the elder brother. They're full of self-pity. That's the curse of Christianity. Curse of Christianity. A lady phoned me up one time, another church about her pastor. And earlier in my ministry, maybe 19 or 20 years ago, I'd have been fooled with this kind of thing. But after years, I don't fool me anymore. And she phoned up and said, uh, uh, Dr. Ruckman, you don't know me, but I'm Mr. So-and-so. And 
uh, you know, my pastor so and so, he's a very good friend of yours. And I just want to tell you something and blah, 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 blah. Old telephone line rang for about 25 minutes, you know, and oh, and it was fine, it was this, you know, fine, it was. And when I was in the hospital, he didn't even come and see me. And I've done so much, and I've given my life for that church, and I've been in that church for 25 years, and I've done this, and I've played the piano, and I've taught Sunday school, and I've been president of WNU, and I've done this, and I've done that, and no appreciation, and no thankfulness, and no thanksgiving, and let me tell you something else, blah, 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 blah. I never heard so much self pity in all my life. That woman was just one great big mass of uh, oh how rotten I've been treated. And well, you know what you know what she was doing? She was just cutting that man down the ground. And you talk to that woman, oh oh I never oh I never intended that oh I never oh I'm, I didn't had no idea that I uh, yeah but you see it's unconscious. And once you get just to be me 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 and nobody else, then just everything everything around suffers from it. Self-preservation is not the law of Christian life. It's not the law of Christian life, and self-pity will develop that kind of thing. You develop that kind of thing where you're uh, taking money from people that doesn't belong to you, taking property from people that doesn't belong to you, hurting people unnecessarily, sticking your nose other people's business, uh, shortcutting them, trying to knock them out of opportunities without intending to. Self-preservation is no law of life for a Christian, and when a Christian gets feeling sorry for himself, he unconsciously destroys other people. One of the one of Muhammad's followers woke up in the middle of the night and he went to his master and he said, Master, my six brethren are asleep and I alone stay awake to worship Allah. <laughs> and the master told him, he said, if all you can find to worship Allah is cutting down your six brethren, you do better to sleep. <laughs> Had a lot of truth in that. All right, what's the cure for self-pity? Well, one of the greatest cure is the self-pity I know of is to consider your blessings. I know it's an old song. I know it's a cliche. Count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it'll surprise you what the Lord has done. Uh, it's, you know, it's Christ, the Christian, but it's true. But it's true. Consider your blessings. Now, I know some of you have real problems here this morning, real troubles, and probably some people out in the radio audience this morning have troubles I know nothing about, and I hope and pray to God I'll never will know anything about it. And I don't, I'm not talking down my nose to anybody, because I know how life goes. But I'll tell you, dying truth, if you just count your blessings, pretty soon some of that self-pity is going to get, get rid of it. Lord, been awful good to you. In 1963, a great man came through Pensacola, and probably nobody ever noticed him. I'm sure some men came to Pensacola, Life Magazine, but down here, take the picture. But in 1963 and 1964, one of the greatest men that ever lived came through Pensacola, he graduated as a lieutenant junior grade from the Naval Air Station. And I guess nobody in town even knew him. His name was Dieter Dangler. And Dieter Dangler had problems. He graduated out here in 63 and 64. Dieter Dangler went to Vietnam. Dieter Dangler was raised in Germany after World War II and got his food out of garbage cans when he was a boy. That was the only place you'd get any food. And he got very self-sufficient. Good taking care of number one. Real good at it. And he got over to Vietnam and he was shot down February 66, 1965 after destroying an enemy battery. And when he, his helicopter crashed and he got out, he said, I'll make it on my own. And he got out in the jungles and disobeyed the first two laws of survival. One of them was stay away from water holes. I mean, they'll wait for you there. And he got captured. And he escaped and got captured again. And the second time he got captured, he related this story. He said that they took him and hauled him off of this place where they kept about 20 men, about 25 miles back to the mountains. And on the way, they caught him trying to escape the game. They stretched him down eagle-wise in the ground and laid him down there and kept him bound to the ground that way for a day and a night with the leeches and the mosquitoes all over him. Then they took him and hung him upside down by his feet and stuck an ant hill in his mouth, an ant hive. And he had ants eating on his mouth and face and screamed till he passed out. Now, what troubles do you have this morning? What were those troubles? What was that terrible injustice you were getting done to you? And he got hung up there and had that ant hive stuck in his mouth, made it on him, they took him down. He was beat twice and was unconscious before he got to the prison. I mean, just beat clean out. One time he, he 
called him some bad names after he regained consciousness, and they tied him to a water buffalo and dragged him till he passed out. They got him to the place and put him in there in a stockade with about 20 men. Dieter Dingler said some of these men had been in there for two years. And the things they ate, I couldn't even describe. I wouldn't even describe it in a mixed audience. And most of them ate rats and snakes too, just sinned with a bamboo, burning bamboo. They ate stuff I wouldn't describe right now, just make everybody sick listening to it. And about once a month they'd take them out and put an M1 on them, the Army American M1, and threaten to kill them and just try to get them to sweat and then send them on back until they fellows are more anxious to die than they were to live, and then the joke lost all its meaning. And they'd tell them, you see this M1 is bought with American tax money, you know, and send them back. Make a long story short, Peter Dinger escaped. And he got out and uh, with a buddy, and they hadn't gone five miles, and they got attacked, and his buddy got killed, got a leg cut off and bled to death. And he got off through the bushes, and liver disease, kidney disease, and the bones on his feet showing. I mean the bones on the ground, man, on his feet. And right before he passed out the last time, he said he lay down there and he thought he saw heaven and he saw doors open and swinging and heard trumpets blowing and he said he saw chariot races up in heaven. <laughs> but the chariots running up and down, you know, and all these bugles blowing and stuff. And about that time, somebody reached down out of heaven and gave him a hand and said, come on up, and they grabbed the hand, and it was a fellow coming down the rope ladder from the helicopter, and they got him on back. Now, what was that problem you had? What was that big old pressing problem you had this morning? In Pensacola? You see, one of the best ways to quit feeling sorry for yourself is study some folks that had some troubles, man. You haven't got it too tough, really. Honestly, I don't. Man, I'm riding in cloud nine. I'm got a, a, I am got a legitimate gripe in this world. I got some gripes, but they're not legitimate. <laughs> they're not legitimate. They're not proper. Uh, consider the troubles of others. Uh, one time, there's a lady over in the uh, in the uh, India. She's a missionary. Name name is Tan Moody. And that young lady got saved. She married a fellow was saved, and she wanted to go to the mission field, and he didn't. And he went off to Vietnam and got wounded, and got wounded bad. I mean, real bad. And when he came back, he was bitter about it, and she was bitter about it. They went on there, and she kept trying to convince him this business the mission field, never did. And uh, she was a practical uh, nurse, and did some work in nursing homes with elderly people. And uh, one night she got to the place where she just said, the Lord, I just can't stand this thing anymore. I just can't stand the way it's going. Wasn't get all the husband, everything going to peace, and never going to make the mission field. And the Lord seemed to tell her, he said, uh, go in the next room and look at him. And she went in the next room, he was lying there sleeping, and just turned a little light like there by the bed, and she saw tears dry up all over his face. And she said, you know, for the first time, she said, the thought struck me, that man's been hurt. And that man's been hurt deep. And instead of putting salt in the wound or arguing with him or fussing with him, you ought to try to help him out. And she said that revolutionized the nursing. She went out the next day and she had to be with the lady. And this lady was one of these obese people, weighed about 260 pounds, an ugly woman, homely woman. And she had to minister to her and minister to knees. It wasn't a very thankful job, not a very pleasant job. And the woman had no personality. I mean, just rude and nasty. The world's full of people like that. You ever meet them? You folks, you folks are rare, man. You got it made. And uh, one of these just, I mean, overweight, nobody loved her. Her husband left her years ago. Her daughter never came to see her. Nobody else came to see her. No preacher. And just sitting there, you know, like a vegetable and wasted away. And nobody paying attention to her. And ugly face, ugly personality, griping all the time, complaining. And this woman said that after she saw that thing with her husband, she went in there, and for the first time in her life, she began to see that thing like it was, and began to comfort that woman, and help that woman, and nurse that woman, and she changed that woman's personality in two months. Changed. You know what she did? She quit feeling sorry for herself, and began to feel sorry for others. That's one of the best ways I know to get the victory over it. She's on a mission field today, both her and her husband over in India. Uh, now lastly, the Bible says, consider him. This Lord such contradicts the sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. 
when you can't get a blessing out of thinking about you know, how much you got, and you can't get a blessing to think about how little everybody else has got, then consider what great things the Lord has done for you spiritually. I mean, what he suffered did for you on the cross to save your soul. One of the ladies gave me a poem a day that reads like this. Have you taken it to Jesus? Have you left your burden there? Does he tenderly support you? Have you rolled on him your care? Oh, the sweet unfailing refuge of the everlasting arms and their loving clasp and folded, nothing worries or alarms. Have you taken it to Jesus? Just the thing that's pressing now. Are you trusting him completely with the when and where and how? Oh, the joy of full surrender of our life, our plans are all, proving far above our asking that God answers when we call. Have you taken it to Jesus? It is the only place to go if you want the burden lifted and the soul is for your woe. All the blessedness to nestle like a child upon his breast, finding ever as he promised perfect comfort, peace, and rest. Uh, I've never seen that poem before, but I know that lady. Uh, that lady is a shut-in for 25 years, Tennessee. She's a shut-in for 25 years. Consider him, how great things he has done for you. It isn't, uh, uh, Jesus paid a part, part to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, we washed it white as snow. That isn't a song. You never sang a song like that. Jesus paid a part, you know, part to him I owe. If Jesus paid it all, all in my old sin left the crimson stain. He, he washed it white as snow. The Bible says, consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest he be weary and faint in your mind. All right, let's stand for prayer. Now, Father, bless your people here this morning, and not over the airways, wherever they are. We know that days are going on, the pressure is coming on it by the minute, by the hour, greater every passing week, every passing month. Help them undertake for them. Give them something to be cheerful about and happy about, something to have joy in. Our Lord, give us some soul this week, something we can lead to be, something we can rejoice about and, and uh, dance about, like they did when the prodigal son came home and got saved. And Lord, uh, speak to anybody here this morning from the Father, you know if there's anybody listening to my voice that has never come to thee and trusted you as son as their Savior. And Father, I pray you'll save them this day and they'll not wait. Not like the prodigal did down the hog pen where their clothes are gone, their tatters and rags, and they come home with a memory of the far country. May they come home this day and come back to Father's house is our prayer. It's by my schools, please, and prayer just a few minutes. While the organ is playing, if you're a Christian here this morning and been feeling sorry for yourself and kind of licking the wounds, will you this morning, by the grace of God, by the grace of God, by the grace of God, by the grace, it'll sure take some grace sometimes. Will you, by the grace of God, put the past away? and get up and go on and quit feeling sorry for yourself and quit counting your losses I know some of you lost things some of you may have lost uh, some like life here some have lost things more precious than life itself I know that I know that but when you quit counting the losses and count the blessings and go on and if you're here this morning you've never been saved you stand here an unconverted man, a woman, boy or girl. Will you this morning give your heart to Jesus Christ and trust him as your Savior? Well, the heads are bowed and the eyes are closed. How many of you Christians raise your hand and say, Brother Ruckman, I've been down there in the slew of despond and self-pity long enough and I'm tired of it. I want to come out. I'm going to get out with the grace of God. Have the congregation remember me in prayer. Would you raise your hand? Would you hold your hand up? All right, thank you. There's a half a dozen hands. 
Now, I want you folks that still have your heads bowed and eyes closed. Would you pray for those people right now on about seven hands raised? I'm not going to give you the name, let's mention the name, about seven of them here this morning. Would you remember them right now? Pray for them here. Pray for them. Pray for them. You've ever had a burden yourself? Why, you know what some of them are going through. Before we close the service, does anybody here raise your hand and say, Preacher, as far as I know, I'm not a Christian. I've never been saved. Pray for me. Would you raise your hand? As far as you know, you've never been converted to Jesus Christ. Pray for me. Would you raise your hand? Anywhere in the building. All right, Father, bless the invitation. Speak to hearts of men and women that need their comfort, need exhortation. May the word of God be the balm of Gilead to the soul. And Lord, give them something. Give them something. I can't give them anything but words, Lord. Not even much. Talk comes cheap. Lord, give them something real. Give them something they can rejoice in. And Lord, be with these that are under conviction and too proud, too indifferent to raise a hand, admit their condition. And Father, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 389. Let's sing 389. The hymnal. 389.